What is the AI strategy for the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA? How is DIA using emerging technologies to strengthen its decision advantage? And what does the future hold for technology at DIA? We'll explore these questions and so much more with my very special guest, Ramesh Menon, Chief Technology Officer and Chief Artificial Intelligence Officer at the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency. What is your duties and responsibilities as the Chief Technology Officer and I believe the Chief Artificial Intelligence Officer at DIA? And um, how do these roles, these two roles, these two hats, so to speak, complement and differ? And how do they support the overall mission of the agency? So obviously, I joined three and a half years back as a CTO. I was appointed as a CTO for the agency and the chief AI officer is a relatively new role in federal government. I am both those roles right now. So CTO role is very similar to a CTO role in any large Fortune 100 company. I mean, it's primarily technology strategy, planning, exploration, governance. Uh, I'm also the chair of the technology leadership council for the agency. We, I also sit on the White House Subcommittee for Economic Security, uh, providing broader insights as a technology leader for the uh, national security team. And the chief AI officer role is slightly different. It's very focused. And the primary role for all, all the chief AI officers, I would say, is to comply with the Executive Order 14110, the White House Executive Order on Artificial Intelligence for safe, secure uh, AI. And that's a big part. There are a lot of policies being evolving. I work very closely with the NSC, the National Security Council to craft the NSM. I'm part of the IC Chief AI Officers Council to ensure we have appropriate uh, intelligence community directives to effectively translate the White House ask in terms of IC, what does it mean for our trade crafts? So today we do something called ICD-203 for tradecraft compliance. Going forward, we might have something more than that. What does it mean? When there's a human machine teaming, what can we do and what can we not do? Obviously, our goal is to make sure we have safe, secure AI systems that comply with the US Constitution. And our goal is to make sure we are transparent and we are complying with all the civil liberties that's available to any American citizen in the country. That's wonderful. So you look at both your hats or both your roles, uh, Ramesh, and I'm wondering what are the top challenges you face in, in those positions, if you will, and, and how, are you, how are you addressing those challenges? So there are two types of challenges, right? One is cultural, right? In a large, complex system, making a shift, shifting the portfolio is a challenge. So having a growth mindset, challenging our assumptions, being open-minded is very important, irrespective of the technology. The second part is the speed and scale of technology itself. I mean, two years back, no one would have thought that large language models like GPT-4 would have taken off so much, right? So the speed of technology is so much and industry is pushing hard for commercialization. Now, as a national security leader, I do have a responsibility to make sure that it's secure, it's trusted, it is doing what it's doing, and we have appropriate guardrails so we don't have a system that hallucinates. So there are certain technology gaps which has to be addressed. So we are looking forward to working with our industry partners uh, to ensure we have a safe, secure system before we can deploy it in a production environment. Now we're going to transition, Ramesh, into sort of... Um your technology strategy and highlight some of your key priorities. And, and I'm wondering, what are you doing in this area? And perhaps you can share with us some of that strategy and, and some of those key priorities. So at a broad level, we want to extract the value from data for intelligence advantage. We do it with multiple perspectives. So intelligent advantage is a core priority, but that has to be augmented and complemented with a culture of innovation because of the changes happening externally outside of DoD. Now, to get both of the, those done effectively, I need an adaptive workforce. How do I invest in my people, get the right skills so we have an adaptive workforce? And in that journey, we want to bring in our allies and partners. So we are also looking at operationalizing our partnerships while we are on this journey. So while we continue to modernize our systems and share the information with our allies and partners to get a common intelligence picture, and those downstream systems will eventually enable things like joint all-domain command and control for the services. 
right? That's that's at a broad level, I would say, what the agency is doing. Then you bring it down to different parts of DI, DO, ST, and CIO. It might be slightly different because we also provide the TSS CI network fabric for the community, which is a huge responsibility that we are doing a great job with that too. That's interesting. I was wondering if we could get into the strategy around uh, artificial intelligence. Could you tell us more about it? And really where I'm going is what are the core elements of the strategy? And perhaps you could outline the AI readiness plan. Absolutely. So first thing what I did when I started as a CTO, I created an AI council. And the co-chair of my AI council came from an analysis function, a chief scientist from the analysis team. So it's not a purely technology-driven function. And I had to go through listening session with every single intelligence service center, with every single combatant command. So I'm listening, right? Once I listen, I understand the priorities, what's required for commander of Indo-PACOM, maybe slightly different than what is required for Space Force. So once we listen, there were certain common elements that came out. The most interesting gap that came out was around talent and skills. So we broke down our strategy into five separate pillars. We looked at from platforms and tools, which is very important, which went, goes back to my previous discussion on the convergence of data algorithms and platforms. So platforms and tools are very important. Do we have the right tool chain automation? Do we have a model exchange? Do we have MLOps capability? How does that integrate with existing DevSecOps or NSM8 compliance? So there's a lot of those kind of fundamental uh, laying out the road so people can start using these digital platforms for application development or human machine teaming or machine machine teaming. So that platforms and tools was important part. Then obviously talent and skills. How do we upskill our people? Obviously, unlike private sector, we cannot shift 1,000 people and bring in 1,000 new people. That's almost impossible, right? So we have to upskill our existing people and move them into right career fields so they are effective in their missions. Third would be tradecraft. What is the role of tradecraft? We have been focusing on a quality assurance framework in our tradecraft. That's basically complying to ICD 203. So we take great pride in the reports we provide, and we want to make sure that it is still exquisite and provides that value to our policymakers and warfighters. So tradecraft was very important. Then the rest two were around operationalizing partnership. How can we work with our allies and partners, whether it is British or Australians, and or even other IC and DOD entities? to accelerate the speed and scale of uh, innovation. Then the final element is experimentation. Because these technologies are new, I mean, we can't wait for it to become perfect. We need to start playing around and experimenting and doing things to learn from it because that's one way how an employee or a contractor can learn new things at a rapid pace. Hands-on, trying out things is always the best way, I would say, than waiting for something to be perfect, which may take five to six years. So experimentation is an important aspect. And many great innovations have come out of experimentation. And so we are definitely pushing the limits of innovation with experimentation, including uh, we are one of the transition partners for usdr &E for the neuromorphic process of North Pole. That's wonderful. I'm wondering about certain concepts, and I was hoping you could describe for me the concept of uh, a decision advantage within the context of intelligence. And where I'm going with this is how does AI, and specifically maybe Gen AI, contribute to the advantage for the Defense Intelligence Agency, if you can give us a, a sense of that? So we, I would say we are in an exploratory phase of Gen AI because I don't think the technology is fully there. Although many commercial vendors are trying to sell it and give it to us, we just want to make sure that it is right. There are no unintended consequences. There is no APTs embedded in these models. So the AI supply chain is a very important aspect. And I know we can't wait for a complete AI supply chain before we use it, but we need to have some guardrails so we can use it in a safe and responsible manner to achieve that strategic decision advantage. Now that depends on the mission, right? Depending on the type of mission, we need to have a good understanding of the use cases where AI will create value. And that would depend, depend on it's a, whether it's a human machine teaming, whether it's a machine machine teaming, or whether we are integrating an unmanned capabilities to a manned mission. Ramesh, what emerging IT technologies do you see as having the most, 
uh, you know, significant impact on the future of addressing defense intelligence and and how is the agency preparing to sort of leverage these technologies, burgeoning technologies? So obviously the modernization is always important. When you look from networks perspective, there's things like software defined networks that's evolving. In terms of AI, I would assume that for future operations, there will be people will start integrating unmanned capabilities to manned missions. There are the role of edge AI, swap AI chips, analog AI, quantum networks, I mean, multi-agent or multimodal AI. So there are a lot of different things coming up. But again, it's also our ability to take these changes and integrate into our operating model. So there's two parts, right? One is the technology readiness. Second, once it's a TRL-7 or some decent level, I can move from TRL-7 to TRL-9 uh, in the lab, working with whether it's AFRL or Navy Research Lab or one of my Intel centers, I can do that. But integrating into operations is a bit more intentional, deliberate activity. And I would defer to Terry if he has any additional insights. How do we integrate new capabilities into an operating environment? Because those are long-term programs with specific unique vendors. This has been the Business of Government Hour, a conversation with Mesh Menon, Chief Technology Officer and Chief Artificial Intelligence Officer at the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency. Be sure to join us next time for another informative, insightful, and in-depth conversation on improving government leadership and its effectiveness. Until then, subscribe, download, and listen to the entire interview at iTunes, Spotify, Audible, or on your favorite podcast app. And as always at businessofgovernment.org.